are officially live on Facebook and being recorded. So feel free to get started when you're ready. All right. And um, all right. I think Cindy's going to make a quick announcement for the folks who are in the building, and then we'll uh, we'll get started here in just a second. <laughs> yeah. Last one was there was people else, but it was the one on Coast Guard, so I guess there's whatever the same number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyone? Yeah. I don't know. Um so Christine's handling the online. I'm just waiting for Cindy to do a quick announcement and um Okay. So, yeah. All, all right. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and start this now that uh, Cindy has uh, announced it within the museum. Um, so, the talk that I'm going to be doing for y'all today. Um, is uh, the Sunshiners in Carter County, which I, I know is a bit of a, a weird title for a talk, um, but it's basically, I'm gonna be talking about uh, an organization that would bring youth uh, to, uh, to Carter County, particularly Beaufort, uh, during the summer times um, for, for trips. And this is during the first decade um, of the 20th century. And so before I really, delve into my talk though i want to give a quick shout out to ho h2o captain ecouture uh for sponsoring the live stream and for uh making it possible for people uh to watch this from home all right so uh first off i'm just going to give you a, a lot of background um leading up to the vacation part of the talk um but i'm talking about uh the international sunshine society and specifically the raleigh chapter of it uh the organization was founded in 1900 and the raleigh chapter was kind of founded in 1903 i, I say kind of because you had this group that sort of organically formed in 1903 called the south siders and basically this was a group of children who got together um, in response to a couple of kids' mothers dying, and they felt really bad for these kids. And so they're going to, we're going to do everything we can to cheer these kids up and, and, um, and, and you know, and, and, and sort of bring some sunshine into their lives. Um, and so they kept doing that, though. They, they kept doing uh, charitable work with the poor and the sick and the elderly. And the more and more kids just in Raleigh kept joining this organization where it wasn't just the kids on the south side of Raleigh, it was kids from all over Raleigh. And so in 1904, um, they became co-opted um, into the uh, International Sunshine Society and became a formal club. And so um, I've got this, this paragraph here that really sums up uh, what it is to be a sunshiner. And this was actually written by um, a Raleigh Sunshiner. To be a Sunshiner means to belong to the Sunshine Society. The Sunshine Society is an international organization whose one purpose is to bring sunshine into lives that lack it. And not only to the lives of poor folks, but to lonely people, old people, shut-ins, in fact, to all shadow lives, whatever their rank or station. So this is what the club is all about. And the, the director of this club was Colonel Fred Olds, who uh, called himself a grown-up sunshiner. Um, he has quite an interesting personal history. Um, he had been a colonel in the State Guard, which was the forerunner uh, to the North Carolina National Guard. Um, he was a former newspaper editor. He was a journalist for the News and Observer, the Charlotte Observer. He's also a contributor to the Wilmington newspapers. Um, he's also a um, a North Carolina historian who's one of the really early figures that pushed North Carolina history. In fact, he founded the North Carolina Hall of History, which went on to become the North Carolina Museum of History in downtown Raleigh. 
Um, he was also the secretary of the Raleigh Chamber of Commerce and uh, the director of the Raleigh Sunshiners. And there's just a few of his accomplishments. He had many, many accomplishments throughout his life. Um, and so there, there's right around the time that the Sunshiners are, are really starting up, um, you know, tragedy strikes in his life. He loses both his wife and his son in short succession. And he just goes into this deep, dark place. And uh, his sister-in-law tells him, you know, don't give up on life. Um, you need to really dedicate yourself to something. And he's already doing charitable work. And he's already doing youth outreach, but he really delves deep um, in, into charity and in, in youth sort of involvement and advocacy. Um, so one of so one of the motivations that he had um, for getting into working with youth was that he saw that the here in the early 20th century that youth were facing a real crisis, uh, and he he honed in on uh, cigarettes, which was a massive industry in North Carolina at the time, and he was claiming that uh, young boys were smoking up to two packs a day, um, and this was back in a time where people thought you know, cigarettes weren't all that bad for you, but he, he saw it as being a problem for health and he saw that it caused addiction. He was also uh, worried about drug abuse um, in North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina got into prohibition really early on. Uh, prohibition in North Carolina started in 1909. Um, and um, people started turning to drugs um, because you could get um, stimulants uh, like cocaine um, over the counter pretty easily from drug stores. Um, you could also get opiates really easy, easily. And um, he saw that there's youth uh, were getting caught up in this um, in Raleigh. And um, there's like all these stories of uh, you'd have like a, um, a dance hall, right? And in order, these kids wanted the dance all night long. And in order for them to stay up all night, uh, they were buying cocaine. Um, and uh, getting addicted to it. And then there's all other sorts of activities where kids are wanting these stimulants to stay awake and stay active. Um, he was also worried about cheap novels. Um, these are novels that were sort of glorifying um, murder and crime. And he was worried that these kids were reading these trashy novels and then going out and committing these acts because all these newspapers at the time were sensationalizing stories like that. So kind of like the, the concern that we have today with you know drugs and alcohol and violent films and video games, people in the early 20th century had similar concerns. Um, so, so Fred Alds really believed that the youth needed positive role models and positive engagement. And so he, he saw that he, he saw it as his responsibility to help um, develop future leaders for North Carolina um, to teach selfless behavior. Um, so working charitable work. Um, and he also saw that kids really needed to have fun educational experiences um, because he believed that the schools were failing the kids in North Carolina and that they weren't really learning anything and that you really need to find a way to engage kids with education. And one of those ways was through travel. And he didn't think people traveled enough in North Carolina or in the country at the time. And he was a proponent of tourism in North Carolina. He wrote, we do not know enough about our state. And so travel and stay at the proper places is of the highest benefit. And so out of that came trips that he did with the Sunshiners. He took them to the mountains, he took them to the sea, he took them everywhere in between in North Carolina. And so, with this talk, I'm primarily going to be focusing on his trips to the sea, um, which were he took trips to Beaufort, North Carolina from 1905 to 1909. They skipped a year in 1910, and then the final trip was in 1911. And so this all started out as an experiment um, with boys in August of 1905. Um, you had people coming to Fred Olds um, asking him to start up. A, chap, a Raleigh chapter of the United Boys Brigades of America because he had been a colonel in the State Guard of North Carolina. And this organization was really popular in Wilmington and Goldsboro and really active. And it taught 
uh, Christian values, and uh, more importantly, military drill. So it's sort of like a paramilitary organization where uh, they're teaching kids how to march and use weapons, um, that sort of thing. Um, then, um, so he, he's mulling over this, this, this idea of starting a boys brigade. And so he decides to take a group of 30 Raleigh boys from the Sunshiners to Beaufort for a five day trip to sort of see how he felt about you know, going off and doing things with groups of boys um, for periods of time away from home. And so um, I'm really just gonna run through this real quick and just kind of briefly summarize this first trip. But it, it, he went on excursions to Fort Macon, the life-saving station at Fort Macon, the fisheries laboratory at Pivers Island, Cape Lookout Shockleford Banks. They went to a course on community, um, which at the, the one they went to was WIT, and they also visited Moorhead City. And this would sort of be a model for how he would conduct future trips. And he took the boys out um, boating, fishing, swimming, sunbathing, dancing, uh, long walks on the beach, uh, gave them history lessons, particularly when they went to places like Fort Macon. And at the end of the trip, um, he's, he really enjoyed taking the boys on a trip, but uh, he ultimately decided not to get involved with the Boys Brigade. Instead, he decided to start his own organization called the Daniel Boone Scouts. Um, and this is sort of, this organization was sort of like a precursor to the Boy Scouts of America. Um, Boy Scouts of America didn't start till 1910. Um, I don't think the organization was terribly successful. Um, he tried drawing from the Sunshiners. Um, to populate this, this crowd, but I can't find a whole lot of information about the Daniel Boone Scouts. Um, but out of the, this, this first trip um, came a newspaper contest because while the boys were on this trip in Beaufort, they're writing letters home to their local newspapers and they're getting their stories about their trip published. And this is all from Fred Olds because he's a, a newspaper editor, a newspaper journalist, and uh, he's working for the News Observer. He convinces the News and Observer to have a newspaper contest and they'll publish the two best essays, uh, $5 first place, two and a half dollars for second place. And this is all sponsored by Josephus Daniels, the publisher. Um, and he decided, and so Fred Olds, he decides, and, and by the way, those newspaper contests, that's where we get the, the majority of what we know about the Sunshiners and their trips to Beaufort come from, these really interesting um, essay contests. But anyways, Fred Olds decides that he likes doing these trips so much that he wants to make these Beaufort trips co-ed. So in 1906, he's like, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna go from taking 30 boys to the beach, so I'm gonna take a hundred kids and like split it at 50-50, but he's gonna bring six chaperones with him. And he's pretty cheap. He can do this for under $10 per kid. It's 10 days, basically a dollar a day. And then he also institutes a system of uniforms. This is primarily for more formal occasions that the kids will be engaged in, such as going to church on Sunday or going to uh, formal dances. Uh, the girls are predominantly wearing white um, and uh, the boys are wearing white as well. And this is actually a photo of them outside of Ann Street Methodist and there's Fred Olds there in the middle. It's actually a really big panoramic photo that I've had the crop. Um, he also institutes a unique disciplinary system. One would think that the adults would be in charge of discipline, but he decided to put the kids in charge of discipline. He appointed a youth jury to try um, kids for misbehavior, and that this jury would then um, deliberate, decide what to do, and make a recommendation to Fred Olds, and then he would have the final say on what was to be done. Um, and then he had a system of documenting uh, demerits and the severity of infractions, which wasn't fully kind of spelled out um, in, in some of the essays and, and articles, but he, he did have a system. Um, and then 
because they went to a co-ed system from 1906 to 1908, they had an essay contest for both boys and girls. $5 went to the best story by a boy. $5 went to the best story by a girl. And so with these trips, you're getting both a male and female perspective. Plus, Fred Olds is also publishing his own accounts. So you're actually getting adult one as well. Um, fortunately, the newspaper contests end in 1909. So no no stories from 1909 and 1911 that are from the kids, but Fred Olds is still publishing um, stories about these trips. Um, and another thing that he does is after the 1907 trip, he decides that, man, wouldn't it be great if all the kids in the Sunshine Club could have access to this trip, not just the ones who have come from money. Um, there's a lot of... Um, poor kids that are in the club. And so he decides, uh, it, starting in August 1906, to raise funds for scholar need-based scholarships. And he goes first to the kids that are in the club and says, hey, y'all need to start fundraising. So your friends who can't necessarily afford it can come along too. And they do that. In 1907, the first trip uh, with need-based scholarships is available. And Fred Olds wrote, some children were aided in making the trip, but not even these themselves knew this, it being a secret between their parents and the writer. And but for their aid, they would um, have never seen the ocean, perhaps um, in all their life. The association of these children, rich and poor, during the three years has been productive of a great deal of good. So he's bringing kids together from different social classes, um, from different, yeah, different socioeconomic uh, backgrounds, and they're all having a good time together, and nobody knows who, who's struggling financially to make it, not even the kids themselves who are benefiting. Um, also, uh, in 19, after the 1906 trip, he said, wouldn't it be great if the kids could talk to their parents while they're away from home? And so he gets the Beaufort Telegraph Company and the Western Union to sponsor free telegraph communication for the kids and their parents for starting with the 1907 trip and onwards. Um, and so now I'm actually going to find that I've, I've given you all a ton of background um, about this, this trip and Fred Olds. Um, but now I'm going to start digging into these trips thematically because, as I mentioned, a lot of these trips are similar to one another. They're going to go do the same thing, so I didn't want to repeat myself too much and bore you all. So I'm going to go with the thematic approach. So transportation, getting from Raleigh to Beaufort. So the Norfolk Southern uh, um, uh, Norfolk Southern Railway sponsored private train cars for these kids to travel in for free. Um, so these kids are traveling in comfortable, stylish train cars from Raleigh um, uh, to, to Beaufort. And then they arrive, well, for the first couple of years, they arrive directly in Moorhead City because there's not yet a trestle that spans the Newport River. Um, so they're arriving in Moorhead City, get off the train, and then um, they would board these sail these sharpies, these sailboats that were sort of ubiquitous in Carter County at the time, very popular shallow draft sailboat used in everything from commercial fishing to recreation. Um, They're carrying the kids from, from Moorhead to Beaufort and then all their baggage was placed on a gasoline launch and, and motored over to Beaufort as well. Once they arrived in Beaufort, they were greeted by crowds of local people you know, cheering. They even had, you know, brass bands playing to welcome them to Beaufort. So it was a big, big to do. Um, the, the community was really into these trips. Um, in 1907, um, they, um, there's finally you have a trestle that spans the Newport River. So they're not stopping in Moorhead City anymore. They're going directly to Beaufort. Um, and, and this is what I'm talking about. So you've got the, the railroad that runs straight through Moorhead and you have this trestle that goes over the Newport River and into uh, downtown Beaufort. And this is the first train that crossed. And then, so there was one interesting exception um, to these trips and that's in 1906. 
um, there's a group of boys who decide to not take the train. Um, they decide to paddle the Noose River um, and arrive in Beaufort by boat, by canoe. Um, they, so these group of boys, McNeely Dubose, uh, Richard um, Gersh, uh, Richard Ball, James Joyner Jr. Uh, they're all teenage boys. They all go to Fred Olds and they said, wouldn't it be really cool if we left ahead of everybody else? Because the, the group was supposed to leave on July 16th and arrive in Beaufort on July 16th. He said, wouldn't it be cool if we left 10 days ahead of everybody else and paddled the Noose River and met up with y'all um, in Beaufort? Um, that they probably would have taken um, the like the Harlow Canal um, from the Noose down to the Newport River and then down to, to Beaufort. And Fred Olds was like, that's a really great idea. I'm going to convince your parents to let you do this. And so they're successful. The boys build their own 15 foot canvas canoes, load these canoes up with um, provisions, equipment, and they set off from Raleigh to Beaufort. And it's a very well documented trip. Um, so 19 uh, or July 6th, that evening, they camp out on a sandbar on the Noose River. July 7th, they arrive at Smithfield and there's all these boys that are swimming out in the river and they see these kids coming down um, in canoes and they said, this is so cool. You need to come see our town. And so they take th these boys on a tour of Smithfield, they sleep in the theater there and they stay there for two days and they set off again. Um, camped along the river, evening of the 9th, the 10th. Uh, they, they stop off at this very tiny unnamed community um, on the Noose River at night. And these kids have guns too for hunting. And they come up from the river with guns and they scare this tiny community and they're able to eventually calm them down and say, hey, we just need a lady to cook for us. We'll pay you. And then, so everything goes back to normal. They eat, they sleep, and they head off. 11th, they camp at a lumber mill on the river. The 12th, they stopped off at Goldsboro, visited for a little bit. Then they made their way down and camped out at this small community on the news called Seven Springs. July 13th, they stopped at Kinston. And this is where everything with this trip goes wrong. Because while they're off exploring the town, all the supplies are being stolen out of their canoes. And they get back and everything's gone. And they're like, uh-oh, we can't make the rest of this trip. We don't have any more food. We don't have our camping equipment. Everything's gone. And there's this local guy, this, this Mr. Newborn, who's like, hey, boys, how would you like to go on a fishing trip with me, the Havelock? He's going to go fish around Slocum Creek. Some guy, they do not know. And they're like, okay. And he's like, yeah, after we're done fishing, I'll take you to Beaufort. And so that's exactly what they do. They go fishing around Slocum Creek at Havelock, July 14th and 15th. And then this guy takes them on to Beaufort. And, you know, all the other kids are like, you weren't on the train. How did you get here? Um, so it's very interesting weird story um but but it's kind of cool there's a lot of interesting things that happen with these trips so accommodations where were they staying but when they were visiting in Beaufort because there's no hotels in Beaufort during this time period all the hotels are in Moorhead City well 1905 the first year that they're there they stay at the Duncan house which they call Sunshine Hall um, for their trip they're staying on the second floor sleeping out of hammocks um, and they're basically, that's it. They're just sleeping there. They're not doing anything else there, really. All their time is spent outdoors when they're on these trips, except for when they're sleeping. 1906, the boys stay at the Masonic Lodge on Turner Street. Um, they call this Sunshine Hall. And then the girls are at the Lee Croft House, and they refer to it as Sunshine Villa. Um, the 1907 group ha is forced to be a smaller group um, and th because they can't accommodate as many girls. Um, uh, th there's just not a, there's just not enough accommodations. Um, but on this trip, it's interesting. They're provided with $25 spending money to go blow on the town. Um, 
And that year, the boys are put up in the Beaufort Naval Reserve Armory, um, and the girls are put up at the St. Paul's Episcopal Church Rectory, so where uh, the minister and his wife live. Um, 1908 to 1909, the girls stay at the Masonic Lodge on Turner Street, while the boys are at the Naval Reserve on Armory. Uh, um, I have no idea where the Naval Reserve Armory was because I go through all the old maps of Beaufort and I can't find it. But the, the descriptions say that it's it's somewhere around the waterfront area. So somewhere around Front Street. Um, 1911, the final year, um, the boys are in the Masonic Hall. So what did they eat? They really well for really cheap. They had fish, they had turtle stew, they had crabs, clam fritters, scallop fritters, chicken, beef, veal, mutton. They had tomatoes, potatoes, um, beans, corn, clam chowder, cornbread, biscuit. They're eating very, very well. Of course, all this stuff was very common during this time period. And this is what the locals ate. And they ate, as long as it wasn't raining, they ate all their meals outdoors under live oak trees uh, here, in, here in Beaufort. And um, from the descriptions, they were usually blessed with very good weather. And so most of their meals were outdoors. Um, and so what did they do? Well, one of the things is they just enjoyed Beaufort, went and explored the town and had fun. Um, they, it, they did a lot of things that tourists do today. They went to the old graveyard where Otway Burns is buried and they explored the old graves and saw all the, the accumulation of history um, in Beaufort. Uh, they went and hung out on the boardwalk, just like people do today. Um, it used to be where like a lot, of, they, they talk about the boys going to meet up with local girls. Um, there, they don't quite talk about girls doing it, but I'm sure girls were out flirting with the local boys too. And um, sometimes they would just they'd have these down days where they just explore and find interesting things. And this this photo here is mislabeled. It says June sixteenth trip, nineteen oh six. This was actually in July, and this photo was taken on July twentieth, nineteen oh six. And this is where is on a down day, um, there was a schooner that was in and they had a shark that they had caught. And you can't see it very well because it's not a great photo, but you can see the shark's tail and it's it looks like it might be, could be a hammerhead. Um, but um, you got all these kids on, on the deck and you got Fred Olds right there. Um, and they're all just seeing this massive shark. They'd also hang out on the porch of the Davis house and just that's where they'd meet up with a lot of local people, local kids. Um, baseball was a theme of every trip. Uh, they would have the boys from the Sunshine Club would play uh, the, the Beaufort uh, youth baseball team. The first year, uh, the Sunshine Boys, they beat the Beaufort team, but pretty much after that, the Beaufort team won. Um, they had dances at St. Paul's School, so um, you have St. Paul's uh, Episcopal Church right here, and they had um, a school uh, right next door to it. And this was just another way for Fred Olds to get the Raleigh kids and the and the Beaufort kids to mix and the mingle. Um, there was lawn parties and ice cream socials. Um, this particular one is from that I'm about to talk about is from 1905, where you had a bunch of boys just ate way too much ice cream. Some of them got sick. And the the Fred Olds was trying to introduce the boys to local girls. And it's the description of it sounds very much like a middle school dance where things are just very awkward and, and kind of weird. But by the end of it, they start to get comfortable with one another. And this one boy writes that after our timidity had passed, over, we picked out a girl and invited her to go with us to the lighthouse on the following day, having settled the question of who is to be our girl for the next day's sail. So basically they're they're trying to find a date for their their sailing trip, their picnic out to Cape Lookout. 
Um, there's also boat christening and launch parties. So um, during this time period, boat building was still a very big, um, I mean, we still have boat building part of our county today, but it was a, it was a very big industry and it was, they had a big to do when they had a, a boat of significance that was being launched. And uh, there's a couple of examples I'll give you. So uh, July 18th, 1906, you had the Sunshine was launched. Uh, there's this big steam dredge used for, I, I believe it was for cutting the, the ICW, um, the, interco or the intercoastal waterway, uh, the Core Creek Canal, um, and it was christened by the youngest sunshiner in the group, this young girl, Swanona Busby from Raleigh. And uh, it was named Sunshine after the Sunshiners, so after this club. Um, there's also in 1909, uh, they christened the Sunshine Club, christened the Lillian. It was a gasoline motor launch. Um, built at Atlantic by Dennis Mason, and the pilot was uh, Charlie Fulcher, and the Sunshiners were the first ones to use this boat, and this was the boat that they used for the majority of their trips, uh, the excursions they made throughout Carter County that year. Um, so sailing and fishing was a big thing that they did, um, especially during this time period, sailboats and small gasoline motorboats are how you got around Carter County. Um, and primarily what they're using are Sharpies, just like the one pictured here, flat bottom sailboat, 30 foot range we're talking about, um, extremely popular since the 1870s. And there's a group of them uh, taking a group photo um, in front of a Sharpie in, in downtown Beaufort. And then here's a group of them sailing in one of these Sharpies. And then uh, something, sometimes they, they went out on larger vessels. Uh, 1906, they went on a Sunday cruise um, offshore uh, in the Prince, which this large schooner that was based out of Beaufort, it was owned by a Beaufort merchant um, is in the 70 foot range. Um, in 1906, starting in 1907, you see less and less use of sailboats and, and a greater utilization of motorized boats because this is, they, they use the, the, the Georgia, the Lita, the Diaz Sanders, Ripple, Maple, Petrol, and all these names keep popping up throughout their, their subsequent trips. Um, but it, it's a, this is a, the beginning of a period where there's this big transition from sail to gasoline motors because these marine grade gasoline motors are becoming more and more uh, affordable and more prevalent and a lot of people are converting vessels over from sail to motor or they're they're building purpose-built motor boats as well and this is probably what most of these vessels looked like this one right here this sort of popular design that you see in carter county during the period um, one of their sailing trips that they took was out to the USS Prairie, which USS Prairie was being used by the U.S. Naval Reserves for exercises uh, during this period. And Beaufort had um, a U.S. Naval Reserve station here uh, with a lot of locals uh, were in it. And uh, it was interesting because on one of these trips, they're talking about the prairie being there and they're having to round up people. The, the local Naval Reserve guys to go uh, do their, their training on this vessel. And um, most of them go willingly, but some of them don't. And they have these guys go and hide under beds and hide in closets. And they have these guys coming around from, from the Navy, dragging them out of their homes. Um, and, but um, they, they take a, a sailboat, a Sharpie, um, out through Beaufort Inlet because the, the draft of this vessel, it was too deep for it to come um, into Beaufort um, or Moorhead. And so uh, they, they take the Sharpie out to the prairie with the expectation that they're going to be able to get on board this vessel and socialize with the officers and sailors aboard it. They get there, they're not allowed on board. <laughs> and 
um, it, it, it's funny, um, and, and the girls write about how disappointed that they are because they're not going to get to go flirt with the, the handsome sailors. Um, and they talk about there being a monkey aboard this ship and that the monkey is like running all up and down the rigging and they're just absolutely fascinated by this this monkey and then they're going back in and they're hitting rough water coming through Beaufort Inlet and some of the kids are getting sick um it, it's it's an interesting story <laughs> um there's quite a few times where they go on the outside they go through the inlet um also they um see a lot of weather um while they're out in the water they get caught in a lot of storms and torrential downpours um they also see water spouts pop up on one trip they had three water spouts um pop up while they're sailing back to Beaufort one of which popped up pretty close to the boat one year there's a water spout that actually landed in Beaufort on Front Street and just as soon as it hit Front Street it dissipated but just dumped water everywhere Um, so fishing was a huge thing. Uh, Carter County had been a really popular uh, recreational fishing destination from, you know, the end of the Civil War, really. Um, it's been a, a popular place. Um, and so Fred Olds would take the kids out and they'd go fishing, you know, during this time period, bluefish, kingfish, Spanish mackerel would have been uh, popular to go fishing for on the outside. On the inside, it would have been spot hogfish, croaker trout they also took the kids uh to fort macon um they took them to the u.s life-saving station there um and during this time this was the life-saving station there was brand new at, at fort macon or by beaufort inlet um and they took the kids climb the tower they get this huge panoramic view um they demonstrated their boats and their life-saving equipment to the kids and they demonstrate this one life restoring drill, uh, which isn't quite CPR, it's primarily you know, a way to get water out of people's lungs. And they demonstrated on one of the kids, this George Ash. Uh, they laid him, the, the guys laid him on his stomach while they basically squeezed and beat him in the back um, to demonstrate how this worked. And then they just sort of rubbed his arms and legs to kind of warm him up and like, this is how we do it. Um, so it's it a bit comical, um, but yeah, and then they would go and they'd wander around the fort. And during the fort, uh, during this time period, the fort is overgrown and it's a mess. But Fred Olds gave these big uh, lectures on the Civil War history and the role of Moorhead and Beaufort during the Civil War and Fort Macon. And so he was, this is a, a good educational part of the trip. And then they would, once they were done with that, they'd go swimming out in the ocean or by Fort Macon. And they'd also go collect seashells, that kind of thing. And Fred Olds wrote, um, any trip to Beaufort without a trip to the life-saving station in the in old Fort Macon would really be no trip at all. And I think that's pretty much true today. Um, people come from all over to visit Carter County. And one of the main things they do is they go visit Fort Macon, they go walk the nature trail, and they go visit the beach there. Um, they also visited a core sound community. They'd visit a different one each year. So they go to places like Harker's Island, Marshallburg, Straits. Um, uh, I don't know if they went as far as Atlantic, but they went to places like Wit. Um, the 1905 trip to Wit was very interesting because the, they're, they're taking this little uh, motor boat out there and they see another motor boat like, oh, we should get them to race us to, from Marshallburg to Wit. And so they do that and their, their boat wins and they're like, oh, we're having a great time. And then they're having a picnic out on the beach or out on the shoreline. And there's this gasoline boat called the Sadie catches fire while it's at dock. And there's these two guys that are struggling to put out the flames by themselves because there's two guys in, in one bucket. And Fred Olds tells a group of boys to go jump on board and help them put out the vessel. And this is a gasoline powered boat. This is not a diesel boat. So uh, the chances of explosion are pretty high. Um, and things get pretty bad and the engineer gets scared and jumps overboard all the boys think this is hilarious uh fred olds is like eh, this thing might blow up 
So he, he pulls the boys back after a while. They are able to put out the flames. But this gets turned into a big newspaper article um, that's featured in a whole bunch of newspapers all across North Carolina. And the headline is, Boys Win Thanks, Sunshiners Help Save a Burning Launch. Um, and, and it's basically a thank you note um, from the boat's owner and crew that gets published uh, in the newspapers. Um, Davis Island is a place that they visit frequently. Uh, during this period, uh, George Deming from Cleveland, Ohio, uh, owns the island. Uh, he purchased it in 1904, um, and he's using it for a hunting lodge. Um, the, there had been a guy who had purchased the island previous to him in the, the late 19th century and had actually dumped a whole bunch of soil onto the island, expanded the size of the island, turned it into a 100-acre farm, had a baseball diamond on it. It's sort of an eccentric, uh, rich guy from up north. Uh, but but Deming has it during this period. Um, they welcome guests from Moorhead and Beaufort uh, to come and have picnics on the island. Um, and the property is managed by Charles uh, Lumsden of New Bern. And so that's what they do. The Sunshiners go out there and they have picnics and they go swimming in, in core sound from the island and they're having eating watermelon and, and all those sort of things and they actually this is a, a photo i'm pretty sure this is a photo of them on um on the island because they, they documented everything that they did and they every time there's a photo taken they said this is where a photo is taken um they took trips to cape lookout um, this one trip, 1905, this is where the previous day they they'd had that lawn party where they, they got their dates. And then these boys, they get on the, the boat with their, the, the Beaufort girls and they, they head on out to Cape Lookout in a Sharpie. And these boys are all arguing about who's got the prettiest date. And this one boy says, oh, I've got the prettiest date. And this is how I know I've got the prettiest date. I'm having to fight all the other boys off. Um, to keep this one girl myself and you know they go climb the lighthouse and they have a picnic and um, then you know other things that they do people do these kids were doing when they're at Cape Lookout was they would go find shipwrecks on the ocean side and they would break off things like fasteners and take them home as souvenirs and people do that still today they're not supposed to because it's part of the national seashore now but they but people have been doing this forever um, they also went over to Shackleford Banks, um, and they explored the island. They saw the mullet camps. The, during this time of year, the mullet camps wouldn't have been active, but they saw um, the camps, the wild ponies, collected seashells. Fred Olds was also talking about there being all these sort of fruit trees all over the island, and but the sand dunes were migrating across the island, destroying these fruit trees and destroying the maritime forests. And also, Shackleford Banks had been um, inhabited, but by 1900, no one's living there anymore. But he's talking about all these these migrating sand dunes, just going over all these old houses and basically erasing the presence of of people on the island. And this is what you know. They, one of the big places they go to is Wade Shore on Shackleford Banks, and this is an image of you know a mullet camp from that area. Um, and he talks, they talk about, you know, all, all the Beaufort locals and all the Moorhead City locals, they sail their boats over to Wade Shore and they have picnics. And that's what we do today, still in Carter County. We, Wade Shore is a really popular place to go take your boat out to and just go out there with a beach chair and, you know, uh, have a picnic. Um, they went to Pony Pennings. This is one um, this is where they, they'd have a pony round up and the people would take um, some of the ponies off the island and train them to sort of be horses. But uh, one time they took 150 ponies off the island and they had 300 left that were still there. So there's a lot of uh, ponies on, on the island during this period. And here's an Im image from that period when those roundups. Another place they would go, uh, usually on their way back from Cape Lookout or Shackleford Banks, was they'd make a stop off at Pyra's Island and go to uh, the U.S. Bureau of Fisheries laboratory there. 
uh, which is today the NOAA lab. And But during this time, this lab was pretty new. Um, and it was all state of the art and, um, and sort of cutting edge marine biology um, research was being conducted there. And all the kids were very impressed by this place. Um, and they compared it to a natural science museum, but where all the, um, the, the samples, the, all the organisms there are, are alive. And it's kind of like going to an aquarium, sort of. They have these big holding tanks with fish um, and whatnot. And, and, and so it was, it was a really popular part. They also had a telegraph station there on the island that they would um, visit. And uh, the, the kids were really intrigued by getting to see up close uh, how a telegraph station worked. Um, they also made visits to Moorhead City and especially the Atlantic Hotel. So the Atlantic Hotel was one of the biggest beach resorts in North Carolina during the time period. It was built in the early 1880s um, and it burned down uh, in the 1930s. Um, but it was the place to go. It was Moorhead City's nickname was the summer capital because everybody from Raleigh came down. Oh. Um, but yeah, everybody came down to the Atlantic Hotel. Um, the, governor, the governors would come down there. You had presidents would come down there. People from the North Carolina legislature stayed there. All the biggest names in North Carolina vacationed at the Atlantic Hotel. And this is a shot from the water that just gives you an idea of how big this resort was. And I really like this photo because it shows you all the watercraft that are popular during this time period. So you've got these steam launches and gasoline motorboats and these Sharpies over here. It was truly a big facility. You have this overhead sketch as well. And something that a lot of people don't realize is that on the other side of the train tracks, uh, on the north side, uh, there's other facilities associated with the Atlantic Hotel as well. Like they had a bowling alley and a pool hall. Oh, I, the question is, uh, where's the Atlantic Hotel located? It's located in downtown Moorhead City, not right over by the port. Um, Bogue Sound. Um, oh, uh, man, I have to go look at it, but you, there's a sort marker for it. Um, but one of the things that Fred Olds would do with these kids is he'd take them there during the day to hang out and mix with the North Carolina's elite. But at night, he would take them there for balls. And uh, the Atlantic Hotel had one of the finest ballrooms in North Carolina. Um, and he would take these kids to party there till 10, 10 o'clock at night or mid midnight. And um, then they'd go back to Beaufort. Um, and there's this really interesting story of in 1906, they get aboard this gasoline launch Violet and they take off from the Atlantic Hotel and around 11 p.m. they run aground and they're not very far from Moorhead at this time at all. Um, and high tide isn't until 3 a.m. in the morning. And so they send a steam, the folks in Moorhead send a steam launch out to the rescue, it runs aground. So they're, they're kind of stuck. Then the Sharpie Bessie Helen comes and they take all the girls and the, and the young boys back to Beaufort. And so all the older boys are left on the Violet to have fun. Um, in the middle of the night, out in basically either Bogue Sound, probably Bogue Sound or the, um, and they're just swimming circles circles around the boat. They're getting on top of the pilot house and just jumping off into the water and having kind of a good time. And they're singing ragtime songs. They're popular. Um, and then finally the tide comes up and they're able to make their way back to Beaufort by 3 a.m. Um, this is one of the few instances where uh, Fred Old's documents misbehavior amongst the kids. Apparently some of those younger boys that were went aboard the Bessie Helen, got into a fist fight. And um, they convened like one of these youth um, juries that they had in the wee hours of the morning to, to, to try and sentence these boys. And basically they determined, okay, these boys lose beach privileges for a day. That's their punishment. 
Um, but really they're kind of like, well, boys will be boys kind of thing. We can't blame them. Um, and so Camp Glenn was another Moorhead City activity. So they would sail over to uh, the, the landing at Camp Glenn, um, get off the boat and go ashore. And during this time period, Camp Glenn's a military encampment for the North Carolina National Guard. So they would hang out with the soldiers, the girls would sing for them. Um, they'd watch military maneuvers, they'd watch them uh, practicing with their weapons. Um, and they, uh, they would visit with uh, General Ar Armfield and Colonel Gardner, uh, who were there in charge. And this is what it looked like, um, just sort of a, a sea of tents right along this area. And this is where Cart Community College is located today. These are soldiers hanging out under their tents. And then firing practice, you've got a kid here just watching in the background. And Fred Olds made this interesting observation. He said, we are really not a military nation at all and have only the merest fraction of the military spirit shown by our English cousins. And he's, he's, he, he's, he's writing, he's visiting Camp Glenn at the time and, and making this observation. And of course, this is pre-World War I the United States has a very small military, and by the time World War I came around, the U.S. was placed under a huge strain to, to mobilize and, and build up a military. Um, and so we really weren't a, a big military country, um, but it's, it's kind of interesting now because you've got all these military bases in eastern North Carolina, like um, Cherry Point, Camp Lejeune. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting how much things have changed. Uh, also something that they would go watch was each year they were cutting the intercoastal waterway, um, the, this Core Creek Canal, um, and they would, they'd come up on boats to these big steam dredges and the kids would go climb all over these steam dredges while they're dredging up the canal. And all the locals and Beaufort are like, this canal is never gonna last. It's never gonna work. It's just gonna fill back in. Um, it's still used today. Um, but each year they'd go out and they'd, they'd visit it. In 1911, the canals open and Fred Olds and, his, and the, the boys that are with him travel the length of the Core Creek Canal for the first time. This is what it looks like when a canal finally opened. And so just to give you an idea, so, um, you know, Beaufort and Beaufort Moorhead would be south, down south. And then here is Core Creek. And then the canal runs up here to the Noose River, from, from the Newport River to the, to the Noose River. A better image is over here. So you got Beaufort down here, then Core Creek. And it goes all the way up there and eventually leads up into uh, the Noose. So, uh, all the kids went to church on Sundays and they all wore their, their white uniforms, white dresses for the girls, you know, white clothes for the boys, um, and little white hats as well. Um, and then, of course, Fred Olds is right there in the middle amongst this. I think this might be Ann Street Methodist. Um, but they did Sunday school at the Methodist Church, and then they did sermons at St. Paul's um, is, is how they usually did things on Sundays. And then the rest of the day was usually just kids could go run around and have fun. Or sometimes they would go on sailing excursions. Um, so of course, with these trips, safety is a huge issue. Um, and Fred Olds was constantly saying, I've never had anyone get hurt. I've you know, never had anyone get seriously ill, um, but they had plenty of close calls. Um, of course, putting kids on a flaming boat you know, Core Creek um, was was one instance, but you had Walter Dawn, this one boy, went rowing by himself and uh, he got caught in a current and was being sucked out towards Beaufort Inlet. And he got rescued by a boat that was just happening to pass by. And apparently this sort of thing happened almost every year that they took the kids. These boys would go out in a boat, a little 
rowboat or little sailboat by themselves and get in the trouble. Um, you had Jack Harris and Arthur Holding were so severely sunburned one year that they were sent home on stretchers. Um, so you had no sunscreen at all back then. Um, and then Fred Holt's writing about uh, boys in the ocean. He said, there are some boys who have never seen the ocean before. Think of what this meant to them. Boys, as a rule, court danger. Many of them like to go to the surf because danger lurks there, or to go out to sea and to get on the deck house of a boat simply because there is an ignorant zest of danger, and this has to be ceaselessly guarded against. And uh, he, he wrote this in 1911. This is the last trip that they made to Beaufort, and you can kind of sense in some of his reminiscences and that, that there's been a lot of close calls with some of these trips, particularly with the boys, because some of these boys are just going wild. And it, it's kind of been draining on him and, and weighing on him. Um, but uh, there is no, so, so there's no Beaufort trip in 1910. And the reason for this is because Colonel Olds decides to go on vacation for himself. And he goes on vacation to Europe. He goes all over Europe and has a, a great time doing that. Um, and, and then the last trip, as I mentioned, was summer of 1911. And from then you see a transition. Uh, they basically dissolve the Raleigh Sunshiners and they, they trans, transitions to the boy, Boys and Girl Scouts of America. So in 1910, while Fred Olds is traveling through Europe, uh, he's in England and he's introduced to the Boy Scouts. And he, he's like, this is sort of like what I've been looking for. This is the kind of thing I'm into. This is better than the Daniel Boone Scouts. And um, he actually marches with the, the Boy Scouts while he's in England. Um, and the Boy Scouts of America is founded in 1910. And so he encouraged his sunshiners uh, to join the Boy and the Girl Scouts of America uh, once they got up and going in Raleigh. And by 1912, Fred Olds was a scoutmaster. And that was pretty much the, the end of the sunshiners. Um, the sunshiners did have an interesting legacy. Um, they uh, really, you know, he, Fred Olds had really set out to create future leaders, and he was successful in that. There were many business leaders and even professional athletes that came out of the Raleigh Sunshiners. Um, there's also uh, quite a few marriages also came out of it. You had these, these boys and girls met each other, started dating, eventually got married, and, and had long um, marriages. And uh, Fred Olds, he eventually died on July 2nd, 1935. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of his biggest legacies that people you know, recognize today is the, the Museum of History in downtown Raleigh, he, as he was the founder of it. Um, but also his, his dedication to youth is sort of memorialized in Fred A. Olds Elementary School in Raleigh. Um, and that's basically all that I have for this, this talk um, for y'all. So do y'all have any questions? Nope. And I don't know if, let me see if there's any questions I have from online. You are good online. All right. Well, um, thank you all for coming out and checking out this talk.